Thank you. So what, what I think Dr. Raphael are going to try to do is each give about a 20-minute talk or so and, and allow some time for questions. And, uh, and, and um, if you want, if there's any burning questions while I'm talking, feel free to ask. But you're also welcome to just save them until the end and can ask them there. Um, where's the uh, slide advancing thing? Not that uh, clever. Oh, there it is. Oh, sorry. Uh, so people know who this is? It's not part of the audience. Dan Quayle. That's good. That's good. If, it's, if, if, if people are too young, they don't remember. So, um, yes, one of our infamous vice presidents, and, and he had a number of things that he said which can be guides to how one gives a talk. First of all, he said public speaking is very easy, though this man made more mistakes in public speaking probably than anybody in the last two or three decades. And then he said verbosity leads to unclear, inarticulate things. So I will try to be clear and try not to be too verbose in what I say. He also said that he was recently on a tour of Latin America, and the only regret he had was that he didn't study Latin harder in school, that he could converse with those people. Um, so what is lymphoma as we talk about it? And, and what I'm going to speak about in this part of the talk is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Lymphoma is a tumor of the lymphocytes, and lymphocytes are a part of the blood and the immune system. You find lymphocytes in the blood, inside the bone marrow, which is the, the innards of your, your bones where these cells get made. You find them in lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are the glands that you might notice if you get a sore throat or, 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 or a strep throat. You'll feel swollen glands. And then in the spleen, which is an organ in the abdomen that's a big lymphoid organ. There are two major types of lymphoma. One is called Hodgkin's, and the other is called non-Hodgkin's. Hodgkin's is about 7,500 cases a year in the United States to 8,000. Non-Hodgkin's is more common and represents about 60,000 cases a year. And these diseases are a bit different. I'm not going to talk about Hodgkin's tonight. I'm going to talk about the more common non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, who gets lymphoma? And I, you probably put my questions in backwards because I'm going to try the questions before the, the facts, but, but however the case may be, that's all right. So anyone. I mean, everyone is, is in some way a, a candidate to get lymphoma. That's not to make everybody here feel real badly. It, it, it just strikes across a, a broad patient population. So there are some risk factors. People who are older are more at risk of lymphoma. Men are at a little bit more risk than women. Caucasians are a bit more risk than African Americans and Asians. Uh, there are exposures, toxins, pesticide exposure. One example is Agent R ex exposure to people who were exposed during the Vietnam War. There was an excess of lymphomas in those patients. Radiation exposure. There was a higher incidence of lymphoma in atomic bomb survivors. And then you can see this sometimes as a secondary cancer after you get radiation as a, as a therapy. And then it's also seen in patients who have immune system deficiencies, for example, patients with, with AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, and transplant, organ transplant, like a transplant of a liver or a kidney when your immune system is suppressed. People who have autoimmune disease, diseases like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis are more susceptible. And then uh, unlike many cancers, or perhaps unknown about cancers, there are infections that can cause uh, lymphoma because they cause a stimulation of the immune system chronically, and, and it can lead to the development of lymphomas. There's a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori that can cause lymphomas in the stomach. Hepatitis C and HIV can cause lymphoma. Uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the organism that causes Lyme disease, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, where you get joint pains and bitten by a tick. That can cause a, a lymphoma of the skin. And then there's another kind of uh, organism called chlamydia that can give you uh, lymphomas involving the, the eye, the orbit. So some of these are truly bacterial infections. And in some of these cases, you can treat the bacterial infection, like in a lymphoma of the stomach, never have to give chemotherapy, never have to give radiation therapy. And by reversing that chronic infectious uh, immune stimulation, you can actually have the lymphoma regress completely. Um, Lymphomas have actually been increasing in incidence over the past few decades, although as shown in that top, top blue curve, although they've actually sort of plateaued a bit, and the number now is somewhere about 70,000 cases a year in the United States. Um, what are the symptoms of patients with lymphoma? You can see in large lymph nodes, so swollen glands. Commonly, you'll see those in the neck. Sometimes you can feel them. The patient will come in having felt an enlarged node. Sometimes they're actually large enough that they're visible from across the room. You can see swollen glands in the neck. You can get swollen glands in the groin. You can get swollen glands under the arm. So anywhere where anybody has lymph nodes, they can swell up. And they can also swell up inside of you. So they can swell up in lymph nodes that are in the abdomen, in the belly, or in the chest. You can get fevers, night sweats, or weight loss, what are called B symptoms associated with lymphoma. 
Many patients who have lymphoma are, are tired, they're fatigued when they present. And then if you do have big nodes in the chest, for example, they may press a little bit on your airway and you can get a cough. You can have large nodes in the belly that can give you abdominal pain. So some of the symptoms of the disease are related to where the nodes are enlarged. So as I said, there are about 70,000 new cases of lymphoma in the United States in the past year. We do pretty well with this disease compared to a lot of other kinds of cancer, but there were still 20,000 deaths from lymphoma in the United States in 2014. They can be divided broadly into two big groups of lymphomas, although there are some 40-odd subtypes when you really break it down. But they divide into about 30 to 40 percent of the cases being slow-growing or indolent lymphomas. And then about 60 to 70 percent of them are more aggressive or more rapidly growing lymphomas. But because we can cure so many people, because the slow-growing diseases can grow over decades, there are more than 500,000 people in the United States who are currently alive with or having had lymphoma. There probably are even more. The numbers aren't well worked out. There could be upwards of a million at this point. So it, it is not a rare disease by any means. How do you diagnose this disease? Um, first of all, you, you biopsy a lymph node. So you, you can take out a lymph node, what's called an excisional biopsy, and remove it and look at it under the microscope. You can do a needle biopsy with a core needle biopsy where you, where you put a needle into the node and in the center of that needle, you take out a core of tissue and pull that out. Or you can just take a small needle and aspirate the node, pull back some of the, the, the substance of the node. And all of those are potential ways to do it. And what you look at is a couple of things. You look at the patterns of the cells under the microscope. You look at certain proteins that are present on the cell, certain markers that are present on the cell that help you to sort out what kind of lymphoma it is. And then you can look at the genes or the chromosomes that make that up. And there are certain characteristic chromosomal abnormalities that you can see in patients with lymphoma. So a, a microscope and then some sophisticated lab tests to do that. Um, this slide just shows you a, a smattering of the kinds of lymphoma there are. And, and I didn't list them all. I could fill up a, a slide in small print. I could fill up several slides. But as I said, there are about 40 types of lymphoma. But for the purposes of just thinking about it in this setting, they're broken down into the indolent slow growing and the aggressive faster growing. Um, Shown here is what, a, what a, a one kind of lymphoma, the slow-growing lymphoma, follicular lymphomas, look like under the microscope. So that panel number one is, is a slide of what a lymph node looks like. And there are all these enlarged what are called follicles that fill up the node, these, these round areas. And then if you look what these individual lymphomas look like, and you can see them in the, in the blood, which is shown in slide four, you can see these cells where um, particularly, I don't have a pointer here, but particularly the one, uh, the one all the way over on the, the right side where there's that line sort of dividing the middle of the nucleus of the cell and inside of the cell is what's called sleeve. So uh, you can recognize this under the microscope. Now you take it a step further, and as I said, there's a bunch of proteins that are on the surface of these cells, things called CD5, CD10, CD20, CD19. And you run a panel of these markers on your cells, uh, the lab does, and by looking at what particular proteins, what particular markers on the surface of the cell allows you to subtype these into different types of lymphoma. So sometimes just looking under the microscope can be extremely difficult to make a diagnosis and you need to, to have additional information. There are also, as I said, chromosomal translocations that can accompany these. This is a, a, a there, there you have uh, 23 chromosomes in your body and the 14 refers to chromosome 14, the 18 refers to chromosome 18. And what happens in a kind of low-grade lymphoma is that you get a, a, a breakage of the chromosome, so material moves from one chromosome to another chromosome. And you have this gene that's called BCL2. And what BCL2 is, is a gene that prevents cell death. So in, in low-grade lymphoma, in follicular lymphoma, the problem is not that the cells are rapidly dividing, but there's cell turnover naturally in your body. Cells live, cells die, cells divide, they're replaced by other cells. These cells don't die appropriately and they don't get signals to die, so they accumulate too much in the body. Um, once you've made the diagnosis, we do a bunch of tests to do what's called staging the disease. We do some laboratory tests, routine laboratory tests, like checking out your, your hemoglobin, whether you're anemic, your white blood count. We do some CT scans, and, and then we do a bone marrow biopsy to take a look. And the way it's staged is one, two, three, four. Stage one is if you have a single lymph node area that's involved. So up here, sort of a lymph node under the arm. In stage two, you have two or more lymph nodes, but they're on the same side of the diaphragm. 
the diaphragm, which is big muscle that divides the chest from the abdomen. So if you got two areas of lymph nodes that are in the chest, that would be stage two. Stage three is when both sides of the diaphragm are involved. And stage four is if you have organ involvement, like the liver or the lung or the bone marrow. So for the low-grade lymphomas, the median age of presentation is age 50 to 60. Almost everybody presents with an advanced stage of disease, stage three or four, but fortunately, patients can survive for a very long time with this disease, 15 to 20 years. Now, about 10 to 20 percent of patients with low-grade lymphoma will show up with stage one or stage two disease, so one lymph node group or two lymph node groups, but on the same side of the diaphragm. In those cases, you can treat with just radiation therapy, and you can get very long remissions, as you can see in this slide. So the, 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 the uh, purple curve is the freedom from relapse, and you see that bottom part of the patient in years. So even after 12 or 15 years, many of the patients remain in remission. And looking at the survival, that the, the yellow curve, it goes out to about 30 years. So some of these people are not dying of lymphoma. In fact, the majority aren't. If you start with people that are 70 years old and have an early stage lymphoma, whatever curve you're going to look at, lymphoma or not, at the age of 90, 95, 100, the, the people are going to uh, unfortunately die. Um, the other uh, way in which these present more commonly is in advanced stage. So when you have an advanced stage 3 or 4 low-grade lymphoma, there's lots of ways you can treat it, and I'm going to cover a few of those. One thing is to do what's called a watch-and-wait approach, which is to not treat. And these go back, uh, this philosophy goes back 30-some-odd years. There was a study done at Stanford where they took 83 patients who came in with advanced stages of low-grade lymphoma. They were asymptomatic, and then they were treated only if they had disease progression and symptoms. So over 10 years, 73% of those people remained alive. Many people were not treated for many number of years, so the median time until patients got, the average time it took for patients to be treated was about three years. And then a quarter of these people, the interesting thing about low-grade lymphoma is that it can wax and wane spontaneously. So they saw spontaneous regressions of disease in about a quarter of the patients. Now, for those patients who you do have to treat, there's lots of therapy options. You want to decrease the amount of lymphoma, and you want to, you want to decrease the symptoms that people have. And as I said, that there are ways to treat. There are chemotherapy, there are antibodies, there are combinations of chemotherapy. And I'll, I'll point these out in a moment, but one, one of the really uh, novel ways of treating low-grade lymphoma is with what's called monoclonal antibody-based therapy. So uh, in, in 1975, so now 40-some-odd years ago, Kohler and Milstein, these guys won the Nobel Prize for how to make these targeted antibodies that strike at a single protein, and they were able to produce them, but it took a long time until people figured out how to actually make these work to kill cells. And so the, the antibody, which is pictured here as this sort of, uh, sort of triangular shaped thing off of, the, off of the long chest, the antibody can be used to attack the cell directly, the tumor cell. It can use to trigger the immune system of the, the, the patient to, to attack the cell. You can bind a drug or radiation to the antibody, and it allows, it was the first form that we had of very targeted therapy. Rituximab is one of the most commonly used antibodies. And it's mostly a human antibody, so it's mostly made of, of, of human protein, but then there's a small amount of it, the, 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 the targeting part, that's made in mice. And that's the tailored part, the lab-made part of this antibody. And you can use this to treat patients with lymphoma. And so the first studies were done in the mid-1990s, only about 20 years ago. And, and they were really remarkable. They took patients who had previously treated lymphoma with chemotherapy, who had been lots and lots of prior treatments, and they began to see with, with three or four doses of the antibody, they began to see very significant responses in half of the patients. The disease would shrink away. So this was the first time that we could give one of these drugs, and we would only give, in, in practice at that time, four doses, and we're seeing the same kind of responses that we get out of months of chemotherapy. Now, uh, it began to be used as an upfront therapy before patients ever got chemotherapy, and there were very remarkable responses. If you treat as the single drug without any chemotherapy, 75% of patients, 73%, have a response within two months, and patients really go into to remissions with this therapy. Other people began to combine antibodies with chemotherapy, shown in that upper curve there. And when you combine an antibody with chemotherapy, you get better responses than you do with chemotherapy alone. So you get very long times before patients' diseases progress. Another group of investigators attached antibodies to radiation. So they used antibodies to bring radiation directly to the surface of the cell. 
And this is one of the early studies that was done by um, a fellow in Michigan, Mark Kaminsky. And, and if you look at that, that top curve, which is the overall survival, and he'd only followed people out for years at this point when it was published or updated with it, but there were very high response rates, something like an 85% response rate to this combination of antibodies and radiation, and they lasted a very long time. Half of the patients with a single dose of therapy, one dose, were still in remission out of about five years. So pretty, pretty remarkable again. Um, there are some newer therapy options that I wanted to, to mention. Um, we're now starting to look at targeting the, the, the receptor on these cells, what's called the B-cell receptor. And the, the slide is complicated, but basically there are a couple of oral drugs around now that target the machinery of the cell. So when, it, when, it, when something binds to the B-cell, it triggers growth. And it triggers growth by a cascade of these enzymes, of, of proteins inside the cell that get activated. And these are targeted drugs, Idelalicid, Ibrutinib, are targeted drugs that work inside the cell. They're pills. They don't have any of the side effects of chemotherapy, though that's not to say they're free of side effects, but they're, they're very different from chemotherapy. And we see very high response rates, even in patients that have been heavily pretreated. So it's added on to our set of drugs that we can use, and these now are being looked at as initial therapy for low-grade lymphoma. There's another drug called Revlimid, another oral drug which is combined with rituxan, the antibody. And again, response rates have been pretty remarkable. There are national studies looking at this now. Response rates of 93% of people getting a pill and a few antibody infusions. So with minimal toxicity and no chemotherapy, these are very significant responses. There's a new antibody around, a new antibody that, that, that uh, is like rituxan, the earlier antibody but it actually has responses even in patients that did not respond to rituxan. So we're looking at different, different antibody-type therapies. And so what we come up with in the low-grade lymphomas is that um, the survival, if you look at over, if this was a slide that was a different era, the era one is, is, is back in the 1960s and 70s, and era two is 70s and 80s, era three, era three is 80s and 90s, and era four is, is contemporary stuff. And if you look at the, the median survival, it's continuing to improve such that it, it, it extends beyond about 18 years now. That was in the last book. So people are now surviving in the median survival of low-grade lymphoma 20 years, which is, which is a remarkable transition. When I started doing this uh, 20 years ago, give or take, the median survival pretty reliably quoted for this disease was seven years. So it's really been tripled over two decades, and, and there are other novel uh, ideas in sight. So there is a, a concept to cure in, in indolent lymphomas um, where, where you can think of getting away from chemotherapy, where you can just use rituxan alone, where you can use uh, consolidation therapy after you get that first remission with, with any one of these oral agents sometimes, and where we're now developing vaccine therapies to eradicate the last part of disease. So I think within five years probably in the majority of patients, the initial therapy for low-grade lymphoma will probably be non-chemotherapy based. And that, that's a revolutionary transition. Um, I'm going to, uh, for time's sake, uh, um, and because and I'm going I'm to skip this stuff I had on, on aggressive lymphoma, but I'm going to leave you with, with, uh, with a final thought from, from uh, Vice President Quayle. We don't want to go back to tomorrow. We want to go forward. Um, and, and these have been very large advances. So I guess you've put in some questions at the end here.